there, but somebody will figure it out. I'm not used to saying one, two, one, two, but... It's a long time, isn't it? It is. You've got to get to three and four, and I thought, well, oh, better not, you never know what might happen. Hey, look, this is going to be such a joy. Um, I mean, how good was it to see the documentary on a big screen like that? Wow, that was so cool, right? Um, hey, look, so um, most of you are probably sat here going, who the heck is this, um, this idiot? Um, I'm Dan Jennings. Um, I host a podcast. If you haven't yet listened, it's the Desperately Seeking Paul, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Yes, I'm that idiot. Um, if you don't know what a podcast is, then get in touch with Anne Weller. Uh, she knows now. Um, but it's like a little radio show. Every week we dig into some of these memories. And some of the best bits, genuinely, that have been um, on the podcast so far has been digging into this incredible band, The Jam. Um, a band, when you think about it, the lifetime of which we probably know really from like six years of music, if you count the whole of 77, whole of 82. And the legacy that this band have, have left us and the music they've left us is, is just incredible. Um, and it's been such a joy to dig into so many of the characters in, in, through the podcast series. So when you leave here, have a little look at wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, all that. Have a download, have a listen. It'll be lovely to have you on board. Um, now look, we're in a church. So I'm going to try to curb the language, um, but this is, we are going to record this, we will release this as a podcast as well, and we'll dig into some of your memories, some of your questions as we go through this as well, alright? So does that sound good? Okay, cool, All right, let's get underway then. Um, I think, first of all, we obviously have to introduce our guests properly, so we are recording. As I say, I am Dan Jennings, it's, it's a real honour to be here tonight. This is an amazing exhibition, if you haven't had, yet had the chance to wander around, look at the memorabilia. It's an incredible exhibition and fair play to the team who put it together. There's some amazing stuff in there, so do check it out during the run as well. Some incredible events here too. This one is really, really a very, very special one and a real honour to host this, okay? So, your chance to quiz our guests coming up. Please welcome drummer for the best band in the, we're in a church so I can't say that word, world, the jam, Rick Buckler. Feel when you see that documentary and you look back on your life like 45, 40 years ago, how does that feel looking back at all that? Um, well, I must admit, I've only seen that once. When it first came out, I, Never I, again. I thought I'd have a look at it, just see how it's... Yeah, I thought you have done, done a good job on it, actually. Um, it is a bit weird, especially when you think it's like 40 years since the band split and there's still interest in the band. Um, it's very, very, uh, very flattering, really. I mean, we didn't think at the time that what we were doing was going to have that sort of longevity. I mean, it was we were doing it obviously for ourselves because we wanted to be in a band and we wanted to be successful and um, what have you. And that was it was as simple as that. So yeah, to see something like that even made uh, was was something something else. Sure. Yeah. Now we are in Brighton. We're here for the exhibition. This is the modern world and wandering around. There's a lot of your memorabilia. I mean, we talk about the Weller family being magpies. You kept some other stuff as well, didn't you? Yeah, I think probably everybody did. I mean, I know Bruce would have done as well. Um, I mean, I'm very proud of, of everything that happened during that day. I mean, I've got, I've got two kids, so I had to save two of everything to put away in boxes. I mean, I, I don't know whether they want it or, or whatever, but they're going to get it anyway. So, um, yeah, I've got a loft full of stuff. Uh, all, the, all the releases and the books and this, that and the other. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's weird. I mean, I don't get it out and I don't look at it and I don't listen to jam stuff very much. Well, I say very much. I mean, it always seems to be on the radio, but um, it's, it's, it, I know it was a very big part of, it, of all three of our lives and, and um, obviously everything that, that happened afterwards is because of the jam. So I think, personally speaking, I've got a lot to thank the jam for. You know, I know we put a lot of work into it and I... And, uh, and it's nice to think that it paid off in, in more ways than um, we thought it would do at the time. In the documentary, Paul talks about this being 10 years of his life when Steve and he started out, and then I think it would have been eight years of your life with the Jam, six years. No, no, no. Was I was with the Jam from the beginning, with um, from right when we started with, with the name and everything. So we started obviously with um, me, Paul, and Steve Brooks as a band. I mean, but wasn't there this Neil Harris guy? He was mentioned in the documentary. Did you yeah, kick but, him out? What happened to him? Yeah, but he only did about one or two shows. Uh, and he was like, they called upon him when they thought they had some sort of gig to do. But I mean, he often uh, he was going to go on holiday or he just wasn't 
you know, available. And I think he was very much into sort of jazz drumming, so he didn't really, do you know what I mean? It's, you have to have a drummer to make it a proper band, I don't disagree with that at all. But, you know, it's, I think it was a matter of, I don't think he really, he didn't really fit in with what, was, what we were wanting to do. Um, so when I got asked if I would do um, what seemed then was like a big show at the Woking Youth Club, Shearwater Youth Club, I sort of, I said, well, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and Paul just gave me a load of Chuck Berry records. And um, it's only 12 bars, so it wasn't difficult to learn all this stuff. But yeah, and that really, I mean, it, would, it wouldn't be the jam that you would recognise at all. I mean, it's all covers, no, no original material whatsoever. Um, and I think after that first show, uh, I think we were bitten by the bug and we thought, right, this is what we want to do. And we um, pursued it and then we, we got more and more shows. And there was another guy, Dave Waller, who came on board. Um, so, because we, we always try to be a four piece. Um, I mean, Dave Waller fell by the wayside, so did Steve. Uh, Bruce came along a bit later on, on rhythm guitar. <laughs> Excuse me. He came along on rhythm guitar, because Paul was the bass player originally, because he had a Hofner violin, violin bass, just like Paul McCartney, because um, he was a big, 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 big Beatle fan. I heard that Bruce initially wasn't that keen on swapping over there, right? No, I mean, we, we asked Bruce to join before, and he did not like the stuff that we were doing, so he turned us down. Um, because we just couldn't, we couldn't keep four members together for some <laughs> reason or other. We, people were dropping out and what have you. So, um, and I think when Steve left, Paul had to take on lead vocals and play bass, and he wasn't comfortable with that. He wasn't comfortable with playing bass and singing. So he said, well, look, I'm going to play rhythm guitar and sing, because I can do that. Um, and so he said to Bruce, well, if you want to stay in the band, you are now the bass player, officially. Which actually turned out to be a real plus, because if you listen to Bruce's playing, he plays bass like a rhythm guitarist. So he's filling up this, this section of not only bass, but rhythm as well. Um, so me and him tied in as the rhythm section in, in more ways than one, um, which actually turned out to be a benefit. I mean, we didn't think about it too much at the time, but and we were still after trying to find a fourth member. You know, we tried a keyboard player and all sorts, but um, I think by that time, a couple of years had gone by, uh, we were so musically, uh, you know, bound together in the way that we did things, it would have been difficult for a fourth member to come in. So there we were, sort of eventually stuck as, as a three-piece, working very, very hard to sound like four-piece. Uh, and that, I think that's what uh, created the sound that we, that, we, that we had. You mentioned about these covers and these Chuck Berry covers, and you were playing like the local working men clubs and that kind of thing. Was there a point at which you thought, actually, now we sound good? Because presumably at the beginning, Nobody's, no, we were, always, we were always rubbish. <laughs> and, uh, but at the beginning, when you pick up an instrument, you're crap at it, right? We all are. So there must have been a period, but you just worked and worked and worked, put in the hours. There must have been a period before you got signed that you didn't know? No, I think that was the thing. I mean, we, we, we never thought that uh, there was always room for improvement. I think that was, the, that was the thing that we always worked for. And even when we got signed, we still felt that we had to prove ourselves, either to the record company to keep us signed, because you know, once you've got signed, that's, that doesn't mean to sign for the rest of your life. You've still got to sell records, you've still got to perform, you've still got to go out on the road, you've still got to, you still actually have to come up with the goods. So um, I think that made us work really, really hard, to, you know, that we constantly felt that we had to prove ourselves. Um, so we never let, let that go. We never rested on our laurels for one moment. If you look at those dates, I mean, if you look at all the dates that we played from 1977 right the way through to the end, is pretty much full on, and if there's any gaps at all, we're in the studio or we're doing something press-wise or travelling. There's very little time off. I mean, we we almost put ourselves under um, enormous pressure to, you know, we want we, we're here and we're going to bloody well stay, you know. And I think that was the feeling that we we had, and um, you know, I think it just drove us on to work harder and to try better at their songs, you know, the arrangements and everything. If anybody gave us you know, here's, some, here's a list of gigs. Yep, we're doing them. No problem. And never, said no, never said no to anything. Never said no to anything. And we just just worked our asses off for 
that for as long as I mean, in a way, um, it was a bit of a shame because I think there was nobody actually turned around to us and said, uh, "Look, I think you can. I think you can ease up a little now." Um, nobody actually said that you, we could actually start calling the shots a little bit more um, because there was little little control. We were pretty much given the work by the record companies, and we just did it. I mean, we just didn't question it. Well, we loved we loved what we were doing. We loved being on the road, touring and recording. Um, so yeah, we just sort of sucked it up. But I think in the end, it it had a detrimental effect, or it started to. Let's put it that way. I've seen all three of you, so you, Paul, and Bruce, talking about that joy of the beginning. And I guess this is true of so many of us when you first start a job or you know those early parts of your life. There's so much passion about what you're doing and stuff. And so many of you talk about that pre-record deal of like the excitement and you're building something together. Um, there's obviously that bit where it switches from you're playing Woking, and we should talk about some of the places in Woking you play, because you're like 15, 16 year old kids playing what sounds like a gangster's, like Jabba the Hutt's gangster palace, for goodness sake. Was it Michael's? Yeah, Michael's, yeah, Michael's Club. I mean, that, was, that became a residency for us on a Friday night, but it was one of them drinking holes. Um, I mean, back in the day, pubs were starting to shut at 10.30. Um, you know, so anybody who wanted to carry on drinking would go knocking on the door of Michael's Club. Um, and it was one of them places with the doors on the street with a little square hole in it. And you knocked on the door and then somebody would peep at you and see whether they'd let you in or not. And then you would fly the stairs up to the top and there'd be a bouncer there. And uh, he, to get in, he was supposed to be in a club, so he had to, he had to rent a tie off this guy. That was a fiver. Um, <laughs> and a black bin bag full of ties. Um, and then they let you into this club and we were the band and stuff. Uh, on a Friday night, we played there every Friday night. Um, it was one of those places. If you went there during the day, you really wouldn't want. We wouldn't want to be there. It didn't. It wasn't good at all. But at night, it looked great. You know, <laughs> because all the lights were out, and uh, it was always packed with people drinking and dancing and, and what have you. Um, it was a proper seedy little club. Right. So it switches from that fairly quickly, from what I can work out, to. They kind of, we'll talk about the, the world of punk and how whether the jam were punk or not punk, mod or not mod. But from this, I mean, Paul talks in the documentary about you know, 50 people at this residency in London at the, the Cow, was it the Red Cow? Um, and then a week later, 100 people, and then suddenly it's around the block, and boom, you've taken off. That must have been massively exciting. Um, well, it was, but you know, we were getting very, very frustrated. We were sending tapes to the record companies to sign us, sign us, and, no, and we get some really silly letters back from them saying, you know, you, no, we don't think you're the sort of thing that um, we want to sign. I mean, this is all pre-punk, if you like, or, um, but the, the pub rock scene in London was growing. You know, there was, there was bands that were playing, you know, Dr. Feelgood were already there, um, Stranglers were already there, I think they were called the Guildford Stranglers or something at the time. So there was a, there was a healthy live thing in London. And we'd see all this going on in, in um, Melody Maker and Sounds and what have you. Um, so we decided that we were going to give up our luxurious life of five quid a night in Woking and, and go to London and play for nothing. Because these clubs didn't pay you anything at all, really. You know, they had so many bands that wanted to play, you know, the Nashville Rooms or the 100 Club or the Mar especially the Marquee. Uh, they didn't any dosh at all. So it was a real leap of faith to to drive into London, play these places, and to try and win an audience, because we were, we wanted an audience of our own age. You know, we got, when you played the clubs, it was, people were there because they liked to have a drink, and the booze was cheap, and, and whoever, they didn't care who, who was on. And because we did a lot of covers, that meant that most of the time we were working for every Friday night, every Saturday night, sometimes Sundays. So, after about three, four years, we decided, look, we've had enough of this. Because we were just going round and round the same clubs around Surrey and Woking. Well, there's only so many times you can have your family up dancing before at the beginning of gigs and stuff to get it all kicked off as well. Oh, right, yeah, exactly. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, it was just lovely to get out of those places and to start playing to... And we discovered the pub scene, you know, the, the pub rock scene in London. Um, but it was like extra pressure on us again because we started to see how good some of the other bands were. You know, there was Joe Strummer with his 101ers that were there, you know, pre-Clash days. 
Um, and we sort of fitted in because we, we played fast rock and roll. Most of, a lot of covers, again. But we started to get our own, sort of uh, writing our own material by that time. So it was, it was just fabulous. And then, um, obviously, that, that particular scene started to take off. Punk emerged in some of the clubs, like the Roxy and, and what have you. Um, and we sort of became part of it but not part of it, if you know what I mean. There was, we had audiences that were, were going to all of the shows. They go to the Damned and then they come and see us. Or, you know what I mean? So the, 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 uh, the, the audience was very mixed between um, skinheads and, uh, you know, and, and mods and punks and, and what have you. But the, the, the whole thing about it was that it was a younger audience and it was always a lively, very lively show. And it felt like at that time, young people suddenly had something that was theirs. That the, this music scene was something for, I mean, the amount of kids that were coming, and you were all being kids, right, coming to these gigs, but the amount of kids coming to your gigs, about 14, 15 year olds, it was, because it was their music, wasn't it? Well, it was. I mean, they, they were officially pub gigs, so you weren't supposed to be under 18. Right. But they didn't seem that worried at the time. Uh, you know, you, you people could still get in and do these shows. Um, but it was, it was exciting because uh, it gained the attention of the record companies because these clubs were full all the time. Um, it doesn't matter who the band was, they, they, you know, there, was a, there was a real upsurge of, of some of the bands were just really fantastic. You know, and we were, I suppose in a way we, we, we hit London at the right time to be part of that. So, because the, the record companies wouldn't come out of London, if you wanted to be noticed you had to go to London. Um, and so there was, then there started to be this buzz about who was going to get signed, you know, and, and the punk scene started to, especially the punk bands, they grabbed the headlines, they grabbed all of the, you know, the newspaper stuff and, and got a lot of media attention, um, which brought a lot of attention onto what else was going on in London. So these clubs and what have you were, were, were full every, every weekend and um, I think we started again our own fans because of that. And, like, well, once the record companies decided um, that you know they should have, they should check this out and see what's uh, see what's going, you know, because that's what they go by. They haven't got a crystal ball. If they start seeing everybody getting into this stuff and getting into the bands, that's you know they they feel almost obliged. We want some of it as well. So, so who's out there? Who are we going to sign up? Now this very nearly didn't happen. So there are a few things. Am I right in thinking you were you were one of the more accident prone members of the crew? One of the bands. Me? Yeah, was that not right? <laughs> it was in his own book, folks. Um, the, <laughs> tell me about the fly posting story. Can you remember this? So there's, there's Bruce and Paul in one of the cars, and you and John in the other car. Yeah. And this could have been the end of Rick. So <laughs> tell me what happened there. What, well, after I went through the red light, or before I went through the red light? <laughs> I want to know about the red light. <laughs> well, after the red, I went through the red light, um, we were going through an underpass. It was my first car, a little mini. We'd been out all night sticking up posters to advertise the gigs we were in. We were, good, we were doing around London, you know, bucket of paste, big brush, pile of posters. And um, we just simply wrote the date on the bottom and then slapped these things on the wall. And um, Bruce had a, he, was, he had a Cortina. So Paul and Bruce were in the car in front. They were going down the A3 and the A3 is full of underpasses, isn't it? If you ever go through, they're still the same. And I was with John. John's got the bucket of paste, and we we go into this underpass, and there's this really great sleeper in the middle of the road, it's blocking off the inside lane. So I've swerved over, just missed that. Next time was another big sleeper. I didn't miss that one. We hit that one smack on. The mini rolled straight over. Uh, landed back on its boots um, and I got out of the, the car uh, and I ended up with a broken right ankle and John's staggering about with all this stuff all over him, you know, and he's going, my brains, my brains are coming out. And we go, no, John, John, it's just wallpaper placed, you know what I mean, because when we spun, this bucket had got it all, like, absolutely everywhere. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I wouldn't say, I, that was one accident, yeah. <laughs> well, there are others, we'll come back to them. The other thing, I mean, young kids obviously have nicknames for each other as well, so can we talk through some of these? 
So, and I'm right in thinking, so Pube started out as a nickname for Brooksy. Yeah. And then you yeah, had Sean Curley, yeah. Yeah. Seems. But did it not then, Tufty said it then moved to you. Yeah. Then I you got rid of it quickly. I don't know why I got to, I think it was just somebody thought this is a good name, but uh, Steve <laughs> didn't want it. I don't. I didn't want it. And so it, yeah, <laughs> super it was. Yeah. Yeah. But, you, but you went on to another nickname. Tell me about the next nickname. Uh, I don't know, did I? Uh, Blind Boy. Oh, Blind Boy. Well, yeah, by that time, I think we'd, we'd been signed and the crew gave us all nicknames. So I was Blind Boy because I had, a dark, I had dark glasses on when I was, you know, doing the shows. And some people actually did think that I was blind. You know, that, <laughs> where does he keep his white stick there? Where does he get onto the stage? You know, I thought. Um, Paul was called Saddlebags because he had, he always had, he's, his cardigan with his pockets full of fags and lighter. So he looked like he had saddlebags on the side. Um, Bruce had the nickname of Shower Unit. It wasn't a very good nickname. Um, but he, we were staying in a particular hotel and it was one of them cheap, it was so cheap in the hotel, you had to put your own shower together in the middle of the room, on, in the corner. Uh, and it was, you know, you had to fold this bit out and make sure this was slotted in there and what have you. Uh, and then the shower didn't turn on, so he destroyed it. He said, I can't get anything to work. And, uh, and just literally just smashed it up. So, yeah, but, so that's how he, so he got... But again, that, that nickname didn't last for very long. I mean, it was just... The well, he moved on to Shirley, I think was his name. Shirley, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, we have to talk about the suits as well, because Anne Weller talks about having to constantly wash these suits that kept shrinking. And, and it's funny, when you, I mean, we've got an image of the jam behind us, you think of the iconic suits as being the jam, but actually, tell in the 78, those suits are gone, and, and you're reaching to your own kind of clothes, your own look, aren't you? Yeah, really, from the very early days, we thought that we wanted to be noticed, so we'd all dress the same. Um, you know, there was a few uh, trial and error, there was a trial period when we had white satin jackets, black shirts, white kipper ties. Those kipper ties are special, weren't they? I mean, we hated it, didn't really work. Uh, so we dropped that, and then we thought, right, we'll do what the Beatles did, we'll wear black suits. So we went to Hepworths and got ourselves a suit each, um, you know, tie, slim tie. Thought, this is a bit better. This is, you know, more like, say, feel goods or something like that. We felt a bit more rock and roll then. Um, but I do remember we just had the one suit each. So when we did the first tour of the States, we, I think we did 16 shows in something like 11 days. Um, two shows a night, two nights in New York. Um, start, we started in Los Angeles, did the same thing there, so four shows in two days. San Francisco, Boston, New York. And by the time we got to New York, uh, I tell you, these suits, they could have done the show on their own, they really could. Do you know what I mean? Because they never dried out, they were just soaking. Just put them on, you think, oh, I don't want to wear this suit anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're probably still out there touring somewhere, these suits, I don't have no idea. <laughs> I think they're one of the jam tribute right? The, um, yeah. There's a great bit in the documentary where the, the video camera is behind you, and we're looking at you on the drums, um, and, and, and we see a, a, a sea of faces, some of which probably are here today. Um, that's such a great position, because you're kind of up on a riser, you're kind of literally looking down on people. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I've got my own seat, yeah. my own area. Yeah. And right. it looks like, I mean, it's massively comfortable, obviously, but it's, there's a real athleticism to being a drummer, isn't there? This is, I mean, and look at, particularly how you play, Christ. I mean, it's hard work, isn't it? It is hard work, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kept me fit for, for a, lot of time, a lot of years. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, it. <laughs> It's more than just, just physical. I mean, you've got to keep your mind on the game as well. Uh, as well. So, it, yeah, it was, but I, I, you just don't think about that. You just, just get into the moment. And I was talking to somebody earlier about, um, you know, drumming and, and what have you, and you really only think about that one second. So you know what you've done, and you, you want to think about what's the next thing you're doing. And it's just that one second slot. So you come off stage, and it's like you don't realise you've done an hour and a half, because as far as you're concerned, you're still in this one second. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's the weirdest of feeling. It's, you walk on stage and then whoosh, and you come off and you think, oh, what was that? You know, because you don't think of it like you're sitting back and listening to it. You're just in, totally in that moment for the whole of the show. So 
it's and you just get on with it. And because of the intensity of the show as well, um, it's it's almost just not. There's no time involved in it at all. Well, there are no breaks at all, are you? So every time you finish a song, you're oh, just straight, straight into the next one. I mean, Paul didn't like to do a lot of talking. I don't know what he's like these days, but he didn't like to do a lot of talking in between numbers. You know, um, it was you know kept to an absolute minimum. We had a set list and. We always felt that people were here to listen to the music, not listening to somebody talking. Not like these days, eh? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, they pay money to hear people talk now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we just kept next song, next song, next song. So it was fairly full on anybody who went to the shows. I don't think we let the, 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 the pressure off at all. I mean, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't boring, you know. And, um, but when you think of that athleticism, if you think of like the top athletes in the world today, what they didn't have was a touring drinking culture. <laughs> and a lot of the time, there was a lot of hangovers, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the touring doesn't kill you, it's the partying that does it. <laughs> um, we experimented with that a lot, and I can tell you that that was definitely the case. I mean, it was the only time you had that to yourself at the, at the end of the day. I didn't drink all day long, because I don't know if anybody's tried to play drums when you're drunk. Forget it. It just can't be done. You know, apparently you can play guitar and bass with, 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 with being reasonably tipsy, but I just couldn't do it. So I used to stay sober all day long. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day, you can, you know, you've got, you, you're usually ensconced in some hotel and you can really just sort of, <laughs> cheek for me to say so, well, I let my head down, you know. And, um, and so then, yeah, there was a lot of, it was the only thing that we really felt that was, our little time, and obviously drinking, you get drink anywhere. Um, so yeah, we did quite a lot of that. Um, did you get, were you part of the card tables? Did you play the cards with John Weller and Kenny and all that lot? No, I couldn't afford it. Um, I didn't have wads of cash to do that sort of thing with. Uh, I'm not really a gambler, you know. I'm no good at it for a start, and I've never really liked the idea of it. Um, so no, I used to stay clear of all that. There's a chap I really want to talk about. So we mentioned John Weller, Kenny Wheeler, obviously, you know, absolute legend. But there's this other chap, Dickie Bell. Oh yeah. Tell me about Dickie Bell. Well, where do you want to start? Oh, <laughs> so what was his role? Was he? He was, he a, was a tour manager. He was a tour manager. Yeah. So this is before Kenny took that bit over later on in Paul's career. But his job was to book the dates, was it? No. No. Just no. manage you on tour. The agent books the dates. Right. Right. Uh, Dickie made sure that we got the flights that necessary, that the transport was right, the venue was right. Um, he, did, he did most of the groundwork on um, the day-to-day -day running of a tour. Right. Uh, and he was absolutely brilliant at it. Before he came to work for us, he was working with Iron Maiden. So he, you know, uh, he'd been on, uh, he'd done the, the, the world tours and the tours of the States. Um, yeah, I got on like a house on fire with him. Uh, he was, yeah, he was terrible. But well, there are times when he's not so good at looking after you, though. No, <laughs> I led him astray, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful story about um, you, you like having a load of red wine in your gaff. Mm. And you're meant to be going on tour, I think, that evening or the next day? Next day. Well, it, my, honestly, it, <laughs> we used to be given... Uh, I think Bruce used to have two bottles of Bacardi on every show. Paul would get two bottles of vodka. I'd have two bottles of red wine, uh, which was Paul's blood, which was my favourite tipple. Um, recommended by Dickie Bell, actually. But you can't, well, you can uh, drink two bottles a day. <laughs> <laughs> but not have a liver. <laughs> but I was, I was taking a rest, so I just put it in the cupboard, and I ended up with about 14 bottles in, in the cupboard. And one, we came home from somewhere and we were going to go to the Pink Pop Festival, I think, the next day. So Dickie said, well, look, each stay with around my house, and uh, we'll just get in a cab the next morning, we'll go to Heathrow, we'll get in on a flight, and um, I think it was Belgium that we were flying to. Um, a day early for the, luckily it was a day early for the Pink Pop Festival. But when we got back to my place, we opened up the cupboard, he's gone, oh, look, you've got 14 bottles of red wine. <laughs> so we drank a lot. <laughs> and um, it, my, my missus come downstairs in the morning to go to work and me and Dickie are still on the floor finishing off the last bottle 
as the taxis turned up to take us to the airport. We missed the flight, so we spent another two hours in the bar there. Uh, then we got to wherever we were going, the Pink Pot Festival. And by this time, we were fighting. Me and Dickie were having a fight in front of the Kinks who were playing. And um, I think somebody went and said to John, your tour manager and drummer have arrived, you know. So, uh, and the next day was just, I couldn't remember the next day if I wanted to. <laughs> um, but it was his fault, you know what I mean? I'll blame him for that. Blame Dickie, bless him. Yeah. Um, there, and one other character we should mention uh, before we talk about um, what's next for you and, and let's talk about 1982. Um, let's talk about Vic Coppersmith Heaven, because this guy, I think one of the things when you listen to the jam records is, the way you were able to capture that live sound on record. And that, a lot of that's down to the production as well as anything else. Yeah, well, the band had something to do with it as well. <laughs> well yeah, they were involved. I do believe so. You're right. But. Well, we, <laughs> um, I mean, Vic was great. I mean, um, we tried to record as much as possible live in the studio because that's what we were. We were a live band. That's the way we were used to sort of putting things together. Um, so we'd get the backing tracks down. I can't think of any maybe one or two tracks where the drums were done piecemeal, if you know what I mean. I think it was all done in, in one take, and so therefore then once the drums are down, uh, maybe the bass will stay, and then you start putting on things like, you know, guitars and uh, backing vocals and maybe some percussion and all that sort of thing. Um, but to sort of keep the essence of, of what the song was about, as much as possible it was recorded live in the studio which gives it an edge, which is great. It's a great way of working. Um, the only thing that I regret about that is I wish sometimes we'd have taken some of the songs out on the road before we did the recordings, because we would have ironed out a few things, um, because the recordings always sound a lot better on stuff that we, we routine yeah, a bit more, yeah, right. got rid of some of the rubbishy bits and what have you, rather than trying it out in the studio. Uh, which, you know, I mean, like the first album in the city was pretty much so well routined. We just went in and did the whole thing, yeah. almost virtually live in the studio. I mean, it sounds like it as well, but we had been rehearsing for that album for about five years. So, um, uh, you know, it, it does have that real edge. And it's a real, it's a fantastic sort of slot of about what the band were like, because it was, it really showed us you know, in the recordings, what we were like to go and see live at that time. Albums that came after, more so with Modern World maybe, um, started to get a bit more produced. But I think because Vic Smith was such a great producer to work with, he kept uh, a sort of live vibe about it, even though he slicked it up as far as the recording was concerned. I mean, it was a learning curve for us as well, you know, to, to, to actually go into a studio. There is an art about how you go about doing this. It's, it's, it's difficult for a band just to sort of walk in um, day one and start making great records. I mean, it, 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 it's, it is an art that you have to learn. And Vic was, was brilliant in um, sort of helping us through that. It's, it's amazing you got anything done though, because wasn't he on the phone the entire time as well? He loved, a he loved a telephone call, didn't he, old Vic? <laughs> he was yeah, bloody thing. He was always on the phone to somebody or other. Yeah. I don't know whether he probably just wanted to get out of the room for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, now look, Brighton obviously has big special memories, um, good or bad, I don't know how you see them, but um, for so many fans and for the band, um, this, this December, December the 11th, marks 40 years since that last gig of the jam. How many of you were here? Look at that show. <laughs> Rick's put his hand up. <laughs> Thank goodness. How much can you remember? Um, I mean, the good thing is, we're, there's, there's a new book on the way, 1982, which is looking back at that final year, and, and the whole year, so not just the moment at which you found out that this was going to be the end of the band, the end of your livelihood at that point, but it takes you through all those emotions, but also the making of the gifts. So tell us about that. Why did you want to revisit 1982? Well, it, I didn't really initially. Uh, the publisher, who I did an autobiography with, they said, you know, we want to do a, because it's 40 years, we want to do a book. And they had these set of photos taken from that time. And they sort of presented it, well, why don't we do a book about just 1982? Because the inside story has never really been told. You know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, you know, from the outside, people who saw the band at the last show, blah, 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 blah. 
but how we got to where we did at the beginning of 1982 and how we ended up, I found it particularly difficult actually to cast my mind back and to think, well, what was actually going on at that time um, you know, with the band? I mean, I remember starting the year off, as I'm sure all three of us did, with this great optimism about what we were going to do and, um, and you know, touring-wise, because by that time, everything was laid out in front of us for six months to come. So it, was, it started off really, really well. And to get that sort of uh, announcement from Paul that he, he wanted to get off the treadmill of being in a band and etc. etc. was a real, uh, real shock. Um, yeah, what could possibly go wrong? You know what I mean? We thought about, and we had talked about how bands had fallen by the wayside because they weren't selling, they'd fallen out with each other, one of them had died maybe, you know, um, but the, none of these things had happened to us. You know, and, you were, we, and you were right on top. I mean, this is number one single after single after single, yeah. number one album. You know. Yeah, that's right. It just, um, Paul was very much on his own over thinking this was a good idea. Uh, nobody, I mean, we still, myself and Bridge still felt that we had plenty of stuff in us. You know, there was new things that we were thinking of doing, you know, uh, musically, uh, uh, you know, and we just got to the point where we, we, we could have been thinking about, you know, maybe taking control of it and saying, right, we'll dictate how and when we go on tour and when we do these recordings. Because up until that point, the record company said, right, new single needed by this date. You've got to therefore promote it. You've got a new album to, to take it out. So there was all this pressure that was coming on and uh, it almost seemed relentless. And I think up until that point, we just, like I mentioned earlier, I think we just took it. We just said, yeah, we're, we're Didn't doing occur to you to try and put, the, put your foot on the brake? Didn't occur to anybody, no. Um, and I think that should have been addressed, really. But it wasn't. The far as the management was concerned, it didn't, uh, didn't come on the horizon. Polydor, who were pretty much calling the shots in a lot of ways, they were quite happy. More products, more success, more touring, more product, please. It's like one of those sort of... You know, wheels, and he, I, I could see exactly where Paul was, was saying that he, he wanted to get off this thing, but it seemed like a very permanent solution to a temporary problem. When you spend time looking back on that year as you have done for this book, then, were there elements of it where you kind of go, do you know what, I get it? Because now oh, that, totally. that legacy is, is there forever, right? That's never going to be destroyed. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> I, it still doesn't. It still doesn't add up why Paul decided to pull out when he did. It just didn't make sense. You know, all the reasoning didn't make sense. Uh, Bruce suggested to him, well, look, let's take a year out. Let's stop. Literally, go and do whatever you want. You know, you can, we, you know, you can go off, do your solo things, or go and put your feet up on a beach somewhere for a year, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it just seemed so ridiculous to throw the towel in after all the hard work that we've done to get there, to just simply just throw the baby out with the bathwater. It just seemed silly. Um, the band meant a huge amount, and we knew that at the time, to our fans. Uh, not only to us as you know, members of this, of this musical trio, but to everybody. Um, we didn't care too much about the local company because, you know, they've, you know, they were a necessity, not necessarily, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But to, to everything that we'd, we'd done, we'd worked so hard to achieve this, and it was the goal uh, uh, that, was, that we, we, we wanted to get for ages and ages, and to sort of all of a sudden say, right, we're going to just chuck that away now, um, just didn't seem right. What do you do in that scenario then? So there's something that's I mean, it's completely out of your hands. You obviously try to have a bit of a... This, we could do this, let's try this, whatever, but mm. at the end of the day, the decision's made and you've got no control over it. And I, I had that with a girlfriend once, it was, it was devastating. Oh, tell me you, know, about you get dumped, you know what it's like, you get dumped, you don't want to leave, you know, you don't want to leave, but you have to because she's not interested anymore. We've all been there, right? Oh. <laughs> He's not. <I> don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On multiple occasions, probably. No, but, I, but there's nothing you can do about it, right? No, I know, exactly. I mean, we, we that's exactly how we felt. We just thought, uh, Paul would change his mind. I personally thought that, well, you know, because the gigs were still great. We, we were still selling out shows and the reception we were getting was still fantastic. It was still lovely to come and see us play. And, um, you know, 
it was all it was all going really really well. The record company were happy, and um, so we we quite in a very gentlemanly fashion decided how we were going to go about the rest of the year for the commitments we already had on contracted for etc. How are we going to get through this? Um, and work it together. It was almost like the elephant in the room. After the day that Paul said he was going to leave, it was never mentioned again. Yeah. Nobody said anything about it, really. We didn't talk about it. Uh, we just had this work in front of us, and we got on and did it. So we had another album to give to Polydor. That wasn't going to be a studio, a studio album. Um, so that was why Dig the New Breed was released, because it was a live album. It got us out of the contract with, with Polydor. Um, we had singles that were already recorded that we could release. Um, and we just went about it, in, like I say, in a very gentlemanly fashion. We, we did the shows, we did the tour. And uh, I mean, we should, looking back at it, we could have done a world tour to finish off. But it would have probably gone on for another year and a half, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that's quite what Paul had in mind. So, uh, it didn't, it just turned out to be a UK tour uh, that we'd already planned to do, but we have been doing for a few years, just before the Christmas. We even had our Christmas party. I was going to say this, the Christmas party came after that final game. Yeah, right? we, I mean, how stupid is that, that we even actually had the jam Christmas party uh, after the end of the tour, um, I don't know when was that on something like the 19th of December, and it was the the strangest Christmas party I'd ever been to, because um, there was like two parties going on in the same room. You know, everybody was either gravitating to over to Paul's side, or everybody was gravitating to to mine and Bruce's side. And it was a it was a very sad occasion actually. When did it sink in? Because I would imagine it was in the media, because you would have little breaks where you go off on holiday and do your own things and stuff like that. So. Was it, uh, it wasn't before that gig where you, know, where you kind of, it sunk in that this is all coming to an end, I guess it was after that. Right? Didn't really sink in with me, not properly, until the January of 1983 when, uh, you know, Christmas come along and everybody's, you know, etc. And then um, in January I thought to myself, well this is it, I've, for 10 years I've had a very good reason to get out of bed every morning and I don't have a reason to get out of bed today. It was like that, simple as that. You just, I personally felt that it was very much like being made redundant and you, you sort of stare at the wall for a bit and you, you think, well, what now, you know? Um, it was almost an unbelievable sort of feeling. Um, but, I mean, obviously you soon have to pick yourself up and say, right, I still want to be in a band, I still want to do this, and so that's, that's what I did, and um, I, I put together a, a band, Time UK, and we, we started to, to, uh, to do some shows and get some songs together and what have you. Um, but it was, it was never the same. It was, you know, because we grew up between the three of us musically, and, um, you know, I think we knew each other inside out. On stage there was, there was a magic about the whole thing. We didn't have to talk to each other about what was going to happen. We just knew what was going to happen. We, we were on the stage, and it and it it just did. So it was a it was a very strange time to find yourself in 1983 like that. Yeah, I guess I guess it's that thing of like we all need some kind of purpose in our lives, and suddenly that's been taken away. For a yeah, time. sure. I mean, I, it, I, it was all because we think yeah, I couldn't justify. It. I couldn't think well, what what was it that went wrong? Nothing went wrong. Why are we here? Do you know what I mean? It was it was very odd. I would ask you how you felt about the style council, but we've run out of time for that, so we're going to take, take some Q&A questions from the fans. Actually, I do have one final question for you, for myself. So in the programme for the exhibition, um, there's a little interview, which was the final interview the Jam did. Um, and Bruce didn't rock up, it was the two of you, it was you and Paul. And there's a quote from you, you said, uh, well, the question was, could you ever foresee a time when the band might get back together? And you said, that would be a mistake. The only reasons would be either trying to recapture a memory, which is impossible, or for the money. Both would be wrong. Is that how you feel right now? Well, I still, I, would, I, I don't know about the money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it is a very difficult one because once that flow has been broken, you've got to think to yourself, what's the reasons for actually getting back together? If you're only going to do it just to revisit old songs 
That's a different thing. And it's not really a reform, is it? It's not a, you're just doing it to sort of put on, um, you know, a sort of revisiting gig, if you like. I mean, I did do this later on when I did The Gift. I went and revisited the jam songs. I did that for about two years, and it was great. And I really, you know, because I thought to myself, there's no way I'm going to go through the rest of my life without, without playing those songs again, because we had such a great time doing it. Um, and I, I really wish at times that Paul would be a little, would have been at the time, a bit sort of more light-hearted about it and said, well, let's, let's, we're not going to reform, but we could have done Live Aid or we could have done all sorts of things, just come together and, um, and done one or two shows together, not, not to reform, but just for the hell of it, just for the fun of it, for God's sake, you know. But he just wasn't going to entertain that at all, which I think is a real shame. I mean, there was an occasion when that could have been possible. Um, I think when Bruce joined The Gift, and I think there was a good opportunity. Because um, I said that to Bruce, I said, well, why don't you come along and do some numbers with The Gift? And he loved it, absolutely enjoyed it. You know, because you could see it was like the old days have come back again. We did a few shows and that was really fantastic. And we did, we did approach Paul about, about that. And so, look, just come along. Do two or three numbers. We're not asking. We're not. We're not doing anything more than that. Just for the hell of it. Just for the fun. I won't tell you what he said, but it was. It was uh, <laughs> not in it a was, church. It was virtually. It was just a no. He just wasn't interested. It was a real shame. Um, after all we we'd done, and after all we'd achieved, and you know the the, the great songs that that Paul wrote during that period, I think it would have been lovely to have, uh, yeah. you know, to have, to have just. I think also even just the fact of the three of you kind of getting together and just having a, a beer or whatever the tipple is these days, not the, not the, not the 14 bottles of red wine, um, but just catching up, because I mean, God, that was a magical thing that you went through, it really was. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't, I mean, it's, it, I think there's too much time gone by, and I, I think the reasons for actually doing it now, um, I think that are uh, 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 just gone. I, it's just a real shame. The timing would have would have been everything, but um, I just can't see it. I just can't see it happening. Hey, look, let's take some questions from the lovely people here. Um, we are recording this for a podcast, so um, put your best voice on. No, so if you can say who you are, where you're from, and then your question would be lovely. Bless you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, I was there as a 15-year-old at your last gig, and I'd like to ask you. Who taught you to play the drums? I, me. You're self-taught. <laughs> yeah, just self-taught, really. I just watched other people and picked it up. I did have one guy who showed me a few rudimentals, but that's, who I wouldn't say he taught me to play. Weren't you learning at the bottom of the bed, though? Yeah. So like a big hole in the bottom of your bed. Well, a lot of it is muscle memory, so you, it's just a matter of, I mean, you could just have a pair of sticks and just practice on anything. And um, you don't actually necessarily need a kit to, to get to that stage. As a drummer, what is your favourite jam track, jam song, to play as a drummer? I, all of them. All of them. And lastly... Just, for, for different reasons, I like I mean, the, the... Scrape Away was a real bugger of a song to play, <laughs> but I loved it. Because so, it's a very syncopated, very odd thing. Strange Town, I thought, was a great energy sort of song. I love things like, I mean, any, you name any one of them. Ghosts, how can you play a song with the minimum amount of drums on there and make it sound ghostly, you know? So that, for, for that reason, I think that got close to, to, to succeeding. That for all different reasons, you know, either the energy in it or if I, I felt proud of, of the way that it was recorded. Man in a Corner Shot, that was a great song to actually play to. It just was just seemed natural and, and uh, really fabulous to play live. Um, and I think um, there, there isn't a definitive answer. Okay, and finally, is there a favorite track, regardless of being a drummer? You know, just a favorite jam track? As, as like to listen to. What, a jam track that I like to listen to? Um, I mean, I love Absolute Beginners because it was, often people listen to that and they don't realise it's the jam. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it, was a, it was an exploration for us, like a lot of these songs were. Um, I think that, 
I think that was a good one to listen to. Star, I always thought, was just lovely because it's, it's open. It's really lots of space in there um, when you listen to it on a, on a good stereo. Um, again, really, it's there's all sorts of... Five O'Clock Hero, I think, was probably... I'm quite proud of that song and everything that went into it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a really difficult one because I... I mean, I could talk all night about the songs, you know. Uh, Burning Sky was was was, uh, was a great song um, because it's quite complicated when you listen to all the different sections in it. And that was a, that was a, I think we were sort of ODing on how complicated we could we could we could make something. Um, a bomb. I mean, oh, sorry, but I mean, I'm the really drum, the drumming on that. My God. Yeah. So good. Right. Next question. Where are we? Sorry. Um, most jam fans find it very difficult to put the, the order of it, jam albums in order of preference. What, from six to one, what are your favourite jam albums? <laughs> Is he asking me what jam albums are favourite? From six to one. So if we were, if we were counting down like we were on top of the parts. Okay, I'm sorry, but again, I think they're all great. I love them all. And I might wake up one morning and think, do you know what, that mod cons is not bad. But the next day it will be setting suns or sound effects. I wouldn't like to put them in any particular order. I think one of the things that I think we should be very proud of is the fact that each album in itself is very different from any of the others. And I think we, we, we definitely did that on purpose, not to become boring, not to just simply churn out the same as the last one. I mean, in a lot of ways, the record company were a little bit bemused when Modern World wasn't anything like In The City, you know, but we didn't feel that we could do another In The City. We, we, we wanted to move on, we wanted to do something else. So, and if you look at all those albums, they're all different because of, uh, the band was evolving, you know, the songwriting and playing, arranging, everything. Um, and I don't think we stood still for any moment in time. So it didn't matter what came after, uh, you know, the gift, it would have been different again. I'm sure it would have been. And so that I, you know, I find it impossible to sort of say this one's better than that one or whatever. Um, I, you know, you're asking the wrong man. I like them all. <laughs> A question, yeah, in the middle here. Um, what would you consider the easiest um, jam track to drum? The easiest? The easiest one. I'm trying to get a That's drummer in our band to play a jam <laughs> number, so I need the easiest one. Um. For a beginner. He's a, be For a beginner. beginner drummer. <laughs> I mean, I could throw you in the deep end and say Batman or something, I, but uh, no, I don't know. Uh, just probably start, I would think. It's fairly straightforward. A uh, question, oh, we'll do it here, because only because you're closer, and then I'll put you up first, but then front here. Of all your dreams and achievements, have you got anything left on your bucket list? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry if that sounds smug or anything, but I mean, not that I can think of, but I've, I've always had itchy feet in that respect, and I do tend to get driven by the heart, so if I, if I suddenly find that there is something that I want to do, I will just go ahead and do it. Um, and, uh, but at the moment, um, you know, I've done books, I've done management, I've had a recording studio, I've done roadie as well, would you believe? Obviously, I've been in a band, I've played drums, I do watercolours, I don't anymore, because uh, they're rubbish. <laughs> so it wasn't much of a bucket list or whatever that sort of thing. It was a passion for photography. In that final interview, you mentioned photography. That was what you were going to go off and do. Yeah, because it was a great thing to have on the road and take photographs of, of things. I mean, yeah, I did have a passion for photography for a while, because you could pick it up and put it down. It was something that I could carry around. I still, I still do some photography, but I'm not, I wouldn't say I was any, any, any good at it. Um, that hasn't stopped Derek and Susan who's here today, I don't think. <laughs> Joke, Derek. Um, yeah, question at the back. I hope that you've had a good life after the shock in 1982. And maybe things could get better, although you would never play again. Um, I don't know about, I don't know about never play. I never say never. I mean, it's, I, mean I always enjoy these things. 
It's not that I necessarily like listening to the sound of my own voice. It's just, I don't know, I mean, it might sound a bit silly, but I, I am very proud of what the chair did. And when I meet people like yourselves who are obviously very much into, into it as well, it's just, it's just really nice to think, well, there's people here that appreciate what we did as well. And I think that that's, speaks more than sales or cold discs or, or anything like that. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Question in the middle here. Hi Rick, my name is Mark and I live in Horsham. I was wondering whether you remember playing Leicester de Montfort Hall in the spring of 1982. You played two nights. The first night you played for around two and a half hours, I think. The second night, Paul's amp kept repeatedly cutting out. He smashed his guitar up and walked off stage. Do you remember that? Yeah, vaguely, yeah. And there was a near riot at the end where some of your gear got smashed up and people were, were throwing seats from the balcony. What year? This is 82? 82, and March 82. <laughs> yeah, it's very possible. I mean, it, that sort of thing did all happen every now and again. Um, I remember sitting, I don't know whether this, this was this that particular occasion, but I remember playing and there used to be roads, some of the road crew would be hiding behind the amps um, because that was the best place to, if anything went wrong, that's where they needed to be. And there was a guy working for us, or we, we always called him Ivy Benson, um, who used to look after a lot of the back line. And I remember him popping his head up behind the boxes, Paul's boxes, and having to quickly retreat back down again because there was a guitar coming at him. Um, and he, 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 he nearly died. So I don't think Paul knew he was there. But this guitar came straight down. It was like, I, but I saw what was going on, but I don't know whether anybody else did. So, yeah, there was often um, mechanical failures, let's say, that, uh, that failed seriously after that. You know, I mean, it's, um, it is very frustrating when something like that happens and you're all fired up. Um, and Paul would literally just take it out on, on one of his amps or something, or the guitars. Um, I mean, Dave Little was a guy looking after the guitars, and they'd be all lined up backstage. So if any one of them, the record packers are really fragile. They're horrible things because they're semi-acoustic, really. So if you give them any sort of batch, you might as well throw it away because it was just damaged. So a lot of them did get trashed all the time. Uh, that wasn't unusual. Um, but I do vaguely remember that, that there was some sort of fracas going on in one of the shows. But uh, we were always hurriedly taken backstage. We didn't often see you know, the outcome of everything that went on out front. But yeah, they were the good old days, weren't they, really? There's <laughs> <laughs> actually the neck of one of the guitars in the exhibition, isn't there, from the, one of the broken guitars? Have a look at that. Uh, right, final question. Who's it going to be? Uh, chap on the right hand side. Hi Eric, it's uh, John again from Horsham here. Um, just wondering on the drumming point of view, what was your favourite kit? Was it the Hayburn, the uh, Yamaha or any one of the premier kits you get? Hey, what was your favourite kit? I didn't like any of them actually. <laughs> uh, what do you think I was hitting them for? You know, is that, no, no, they, the premier ones were good because they were free. Premier just gave me kits. That was, that was quite good. Um, I mean, I, I always hankered after owning a Ludwig kit, which I do now, which I think is just a, a, a fabulous drum kit, really fabulous. Um, but I didn't ever have one at the time. Um, the Yamaha kit that I had for, for a very short time was a very good drum kit, but um, it was too good. It used to resonate too much and it wasn't very good for live work. So it used to feed back all the time as soon as you wake it up. So in a way, Premier, for all of their uh, mistakes actually did make a very good live kit because it was robust, it didn't break uh, and you know, and it lasted. So yeah, I suppose the, 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 back in the day the premier ones were the ones to have. You could reliably take them on tour and not have to keep sending off for more bits and spares and stuff. Final question down here, which I promise and then we'll wrap up. What, what are you doing now? Are you doing the signing off the show? Um, well, at this particular moment, um, I've got another book coming out.
about 1982, which are obviously I'll be promoting that for the end of this year. Unfortunately, you don't see many drummers do a do a you know a tour on their own, so <laughs> not yeah. a lot of call for it. Yeah, we'd have to suffer Phil Collins, right? Um, <laughs> 1982, December the 11th, that final gig in Brighton hasn't yet been released as a proper album of that recording. There are rumours floating around that you're the only guy who has a copy of it off the desk. Clean this up for us, Rick, will you? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I think Polydor wanted to film it at, on the day, and uh, I think John said, well, look, I don't want to spend the money filming it. <laughs> uh, so that never happened, so what I did was I, I set up my I had one of the, you know, it was supposed to be a portable video player, but it was this big, you know, and just set it up at the back and filmed it. Uh, so the quality is rubbish, the sound is not particularly good, it can be enhanced. Um, I do have a copy of it, but um, I don't know whether I'll actually ever see the lights of day, really, uh, which would be a shame. Um, it's a shame that we wasn't actually recorded properly at, at the time, you know, as, as the last show, uh, film and everything. Been, it would have been fantastic, um, but say to me, you know, we can all pop back to yours now to have a listen. Please give it up for the legend that is Rick Hopper! Cheers <laughs> to your company, thanks for coming along, all the best.